on topics is good because we need to make decisions that we need as much information as we can uh, integrate that into those decisions. My role today is going to be a little bit interesting uh, because the way the slides roll on the screen, um, that wasn't my dark bar. <laughs> uh, my, my role is to try to bring some of the science into this conversation. So as much as I love to talk about the other topics, I'm going to try to focus uh, pretty exclusively on the science. And well, what we're trying to do is address what should be done about deer and disease. My role is to try to talk about what's likely to happen and why. What I want to really do is talk very briefly about population ecology and about disease ecology. Uh, it's a very short period of time, so we're not going to go into very much depth, but I want to show you a couple of concepts that I think are very important. There we go. Okay, so population ecology. Let's talk a little, just briefly about the population ecology of deer. If we were to bring a couple of deer into an area and let them start populating that area, what we would see is that this population would grow in stair steps. Each spring we know that deer have bonds. Those bonds represent those stair steps. Interestingly, the stair steps are of different heights as we move along. The reason is because we're adding fawns at different rates to this population as it grows. Very early on, we don't have uh, a high number of females. We have very few females. They're all in really great shape, and so they all produce fawns at the maximum capa capacity of deer to produce fawns, which is about two to three fawns for each female. But there aren't very many of them, so they don't produce very many fawns. As the population starts to grow, though, we get lots of females into the population, and so the crop of fawns gets much larger. These females that are producing these fawns are still in very good nutritional condition. But interestingly, this steep rise doesn't continue. It starts to tail off, and ultimately, it will stop growing. And the reason for that, in a very simplistic way, is that while we have lots of females on the landscape, and they can all produce fawns, many of them, especially the younger ones, don't have the nutritional condition necessary to go into the reproductive cycle, and consequently they aren't part of the breeding population. We can talk about a variety of mechanisms that cause that, but nutrition is at the heart of it. And while we look at our environment and we see all sorts of shrubs and grass and wonderful green stuff that we think deer will eat. It turns out that not everything that's green is good for deer to eat. And as a result, when we get to those high populations, some of the younger deer especially aren't getting enough so they don't reproduce. When we start talking about culling, the question is always, how many do we remove? This is where some of this stair step comes into play because when we start reducing the population, we look at how many steps we're going to take this population down because that gives us a sense of how fast the population will grow back in response to our, our removals. And so if we start removing from a mature population, as we might have in, in Meridian Township, we know there's a lot of deer out there. They're probably close to some upper limit. We don't know exactly where they are. But we know if we take a lot of deer from this upper realm, um, we're going to move down that stair step pretty rapidly. And it's going to take some time to recover. But interestingly, as we move into this central realm, we can take a lot of deer out of the population. And that population will recover very quickly. When we get down here, again, we're limited by the number of females who can reproduce. We take a bunch of those females out of the population, the population can't respond very quickly. All right, so there's a semester's worth of population biology in three minutes. Um, 
So here's why we're here. The question is, how many do we need to review, to pull from this population to minimize the risk of spreading disease? And in particular today, we're talking about chronic wasting disease. But we could be talking about more like tuberculosis just as easy. So we start with this question. That takes us into the realm of, of what would we have to pull from this population in order to have an effect on disease? Intuitively, we understand that there is a relationship between the number of deer and the risk of spreading the disease. That's not hard for us to understand. We know that when it's flu season, we think carefully about whether we're going to some big event where there's going to be a lot of people and potentially somebody out there who's ill. So when we've got a lot of deer, we know that this process of potentially removing deer from the population can influence the risk of spread of disease. And we know if we remove deer from this upper realm, we're probably not going to have a huge impact on the spread of disease. If we get down into this second realm, where we're really taking the population down to substantially less than half of what it might be, now we're starting to have a, a more decided effect. And if we manage down here, we can have our maximum effect. I'm not saying we should, I'm just saying intuitively we understand that. Now the question is, of course, why is that? Well, two reasons. One, when we have a disease like CWD where we think there are a few individuals in the population, if we lower the population dramatically, there's a higher probability that we will remove all of the individuals that are infectious. And if we do that, we eliminate the disease from the landscape. But also, we know that there's a relationship between the prevalence of disease in a population and the density of a population. The higher the density, the more likely we are to see a higher prevalence of the disease in the population because these deer are social and they are making contact with one another. And one of the ways that diseases like CWD spread is nose-to-nose -nose contact. So if we reduce the deer density, we have the potential of pulling deer out of the population that might be the, 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 the typhoid berries, and we have the potential of reducing the nose-to-nose -nose contact that is occurring uh, across that landscape and potentially spreading the disease. So here we have our sick deer. Uh, this deer was sick when I took the picture of it. It turned out it had pneumonia, not chronic wasting disease. Uh, and the question we have before us is, if this deer is sick here, what's the likelihood that this deer will become a infected? It's pretty close by. What's the likelihood that this deer that's quite a ways away is going to be affected, infected? Well, again, intuitively we understand what science has been able to demonstrate thoroughly. And that is, the farther away you are from an individual that's diseased, the less likely you are to contract that disease, because the less likely you are to come into contact with that individual. Well, can we quantify that? Can we say, here's the area where contact between individuals is most likely to happen? because that's the area that we probably want to lower the population in to minimize that potential conflict. No, this deer out here really isn't much at risk. Uh, this one is at risk. This one's a kind of peripheral. Can we, can we quantify this? Can we put some real numbers to it? And the answer is yes. What we've learned is that about 95% of the contacts that are going to occur that may relate to this sick animal are going to occur within a five mile radius. If we want to get to 99%, it's about a seven mile radius. This means if we want to allocate resources to try to minimize the potential for that disease to propagate on the landscape, and we're willing to tolerate a little bit of risk, 5% chance that we don't get everybody, or alternatively, 95% chance that we will be 
working with all the deer that are likely to come in contact with one another and this diseased animal. That's circumscribed by this circle of radius of about five miles. Is that, is that a forested area you're talking about or rather than urban area? Okay. It's, what is that, that? area, the, the area where our work was done and informed this model is an environment that looks exactly like Meridian Township. Okay. It's a matrix of forest and agriculture and urban and roads very similar. It was done in New York, but the environment looks very much like what we have. Now, the interesting thing about chronic wasting disease is that it passes from two susceptible deer not only by nose-to-nose -nose contact. It can pass indirectly. Think of cold viruses. We can get them from doorknobs and keyboards. That's indirect transmission of a cold virus us. Well, it, indirect spread of disease is something that typifies chronic wasting disease because these deer that are infected are depositing in their saliva and their urine and their feces the disease agent into the soil. The soil binds with that disease agent. The plants take up that disease agent. That means that deer like this and this who encounter the same field but don't encounter the infected individual and pick up the disease. So now the question is, what's the prospect of our capturing 95% or 99% of the deer that might ever encounter a contaminated spot on the landscape? And the answer is 30 miles. Now we're talking a pretty big chunk of real estate. The good news is that get a buildup of <coughs> chronic wasting disease, uh, disease agents in the soil and in the plants takes quite a while. So if we can prevent that from happening by pulling infected deer off the landscape quickly, it's less likely.